It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you just email me at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. I'm really excited about today's show. We got Dr. Lance Moore. Uh, he's an author. Uh, he's written nine books on all of our topics. Everything we discuss here on the Opera Report all the time, this guy's right up our alley. The book we're talking about today is Cults on Trial, a cross-examination of Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Donald Trump. Don't, <laughs> don't go nuts. Dr. Lance Moore, are you there? Yes. Hey, Ed. Thank you so much, my friend. Before we get into this book, Cults on Trial, uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Dr. Lance Moore? Well, I will add, uh, I hope all your listeners stay tuned because this isn't about bashing Trump, even though uh, I, I'm not a supporter. I want people to remain open-minded and listen to some important things I have to say and uh, hang with us. Uh, but as far as me, uh, I like to think I'm a, a fun, interesting guy. Uh, I've written, I've authored uh, nine books in my 67 years. Uh, I have an odd paradox that uh, I was a professional rock musician, uh, wow. toured and played on stage, never made it famous, just had a lot of fun, and also was an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church. So uh, the, the wonderful thing is that some of my congregations embraced, most of my congregations embraced that I could rock and roll and preach. <laughs> yeah, I was an assistant youth pastor, uh, youth pastor at one time. And uh, the, the youth pastor went on to start his own church. And he was a, just like you, man, musician. Um, there you go. Great worship leader. I love this guy. Um, so then people can find your books at uh, Lance morebooks.com so give us an idea because all your books are like right up our alley why don't you give us an overview of your history of writing books uh, well, uh, that website, easy to find and definitely where you can see them all and nice little pictures of all of them and get them in a, uh, in a quick look. Picture speaks a thousand words. Got the covers on there for all nine books. Uh, and yes, my interests are, are divergent, but they're similar to a lot of the topics that I, that I see you like, Ed. Uh, I have, uh, my best selling book is called Killing JFK, 50 Years, 50 Lies, uh, from the Warren Commission to Bill O'Reilly, A History of Deceit in the JFK. JFK assassination, uh, where I think I take apart the Warren Commission uh, pretty good and show that the government itself, if you dig deep enough, shows there was not only a conspiracy to kill Kennedy, but a conspiracy to cover up the the true culprits. Um, then a, a whole other topic of actually more consistent with my role as pastor. I have a book called A God Beyond Belief, Reclaiming Faith in a Quantum Age, kind of a mixture of science and religion that I think is uh, refreshing from maybe what some people expect of a quote minister. I'm not, as I just said, I'm not a traditional Bible thump thumping pastor. I like to, to think I, I'm open-minded anyway. Uh, I even have a book on um, called Class Crucifixion, which is uh, about the way the ultra-rich have basically robbed the middle class and working folk of uh, a decent living so that they can have multiple yachts and multiple mansions mm -hmm. uh, and that that's not doesn't make me a communist. It makes me a reasonable person who goes, with all of the innovations that computers and technology have brought us, tremendous wealth – it's all gone to the top. So that's a whole other day's topic. So there's a few things. Yeah, I think the way I found you was killing JFK 50 years, 50 lives. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then I, I added you on Facebook, and then I guess a squirrel ran by, and I got distracted. <laughs> I never uh -huh. the show. <laughs> okay. So what are we going to find here in this book here? Um, a Cults on Trial, a cross-examination of Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Donald Trump. Well, the inclusion of the names like Manson, Hitler, and Trump is, is meant by design to be provocative and to kind of attract readers. Uh, I'm not an idiot. I know I have to market books. Writing them is, is only half the battle, as you know. Uh, promoting them is the other half. Um, but here's the phenomenon underlying this topic of cults that intrigued me, and that is that 
there are some very specific, predictable traits and tactics, personality traits, psychological traits, and then methodology, the way that people uh, – of that sort, uh, demagogic leaders and religious cult leaders, ways that they manipulate people that when you step back and kind of drop your emotions and drop your trib- one's tribalism, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or in between, whatever, drop that for a minute and just look at it kind of like a psychological study. It's astounding how this list, which is in the book, is a checklist. Uh, how predictable it is uh, I joke about it. it's predictable in hindsight and of course everything's predictable in hindsight I can predict every football game in hindsight what the final score will be in hindsight but you see what I'm saying you can you can when you step back and look uh, it's amazing how every one of them will follow let's say out of a dozen traits and tactics so most of them are going to check off nine or ten of them uh, and of course there can be variances according to whether they're political or they're religious or whether there's something else like say Scientology uh, it's it's amazing how similar they are and so that's a phenomenon in my mind of, of human nature and human psychology you know that's interesting you know and you see these people, the names are and just in the title, Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Donald Trump. And we don't want to offend anybody, you know. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, some people are sincere with what they're doing. But now, what do you think it is, though? Uh, is it organic? Is it uh, something that uh, they do instinctively that they learn these t- tactics? Because some of these folks, like Jim Jones, you, you know, you hear these stories, the CIA, you know, uh, MK Ultra's trying to kind of plant. What, do you, what did you kind of conclusion did you come to in that area? Well, let me first hit that word offensive. I get, I have had people in my own family that go, are you trying to say Trump is Hitler? Because he's not. And and of course, I'm not stupid. I get that. Hitler uh, killed millions of people, caused worldwide war. I mean, duh, we know that. Uh, the Holocaust is not to be minimized. Um, so, Nowhere in my book am I saying that Trump is Hitler at all. In fact, my chapter on Trump, uh, which is one of many chapters, uh, starts by giving that disclaimer that I'm not equating the two. But I'm talking about something bigger, again, than tribalism or or politics, about the question that you didn't ask, which is, you know, what's going on with people who seem to fit this – this paradigm or this pattern of being a leader, but being a leader who has specific methods and ego traits. So anyway, to, to get to the answer you've, of what you've asked, it's to me uh, in, in, a, in a phrase, malignant narcissism. And, and if you'll mm. bear with me, I'll un, unpack that just a second. Um, I have a theory that we're all narcissists, Ed. Uh, I I know we all – nature instills us with a survival instinct, take care of number one first. Everybody has an ego. Uh, You and I have egos. We want to be thought well of, et cetera. And that's sort of like normal walking around narcissism, self-interest. Nothing wrong with that really. But the word malignant, when it becomes where a person, these leaders in particular, seem to only be able to care about themselves and we can have a longer conversation about where that comes from was that instilled in Jim Jones by MK Ultra mm. or was it from birth or was it from parenting I talk a little bit about that in my book about uh, what forms a cult leader and that's still an open debate uh, you know that old uh, is it nature or nurture was it you know were you were you born with a twisted mind uh, or were you or, or did the mind become twisted because you were abused or whatever it might be um, and so we'll talk about that in the book in a nutshell, I, I conclude, for our purposes of dealing with this as a society, I'm not so sure it's helpful to to have to ascertain exactly where the, where they emerged from or how mm-hmm. they emerged is what do we do about it, you know? And 
the answer to that, I think, has to do with the word truth. But anyway, let me pause and you jump in here with me. Help me out. Well, first of all, when you mentioned how we're all a bit narcissist, I remember when I first learned the word, I first learned the definition of the world in the, in the word in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Me and my girlfriend looked at each other and said, we're both narcissists. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Prove my point. Thank yeah, you. So we are. <laughs> and I, 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 I I'll throw this joke in there. What's the difference between um, someone who's a narcissist and someone who's not? <laughs> so the first, the first category are just honest. <laughs> the second one is just self-deceived. <laughs> but it's something we should all work on. You know, we we, we don't want to encourage that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want to have limits to it. That's the point. Is that um, uh, taking care of oneself? You know, you got to do that. You got to eat right and exercise and sleep and all those basic things and and have have an income. All those things. Duh. That's we can't all go up on a mountain and be a monk, you know, and retreat from the world. We have to be engaged in the world, and to be engaged in the world, we have to be confident in ourselves and and self supporting and all that. You can you can make an argument for self care without a problem but the limits and that quick limit when it comes to the ones on the title on the, on the top, subtitle of my book is when they don't show any sign of empathy or care for persons beyond their immediate orbit where sure they're going to be nice to their own family uh well let's let's take trump and hitler just real quick again they're not the same but trump loves his children that's obvious uh, Hitler loved dogs, his pets, and children. He was very loving toward them, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't cure the narcissism. The narcissism is is measured or tested by the next uh, circle outside that. The people that, that work for you, the, your staff, uh, uh, the people that are, are the next ring out who are just people in the community that you barely know. Are you caring about them? Are you reaching out to them? Or do you throw them under the bus when they no longer are useful? Uh, and I, I, I would challenge, like I say, even pro-Trump supporters, uh, look, look at Trump's career uh, when once people have ceased being useful to him, be honest. What does he do with them? Let's take one name. Somebody I actually know, Jeff Sessions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeff Sessions was the most wonderful person on earth when Trump appointed him as attorney general. But then once Sessions did one little thing that Trump didn't like, he ruined the man's career, threw him under the bus. He couldn't get reelected. And he had initially been elected senator of my own state in Alabama by a landslide. Uh, Trump destroyed him. Uh, now, I could go down that list. I bet you could too, Ed, right? And sure. add names to that. Uh, is, isn't that pretty <laughs> compelling? Well, then let me ask you this, because you and me were talking about this, and we're coming at this from the angle of of the narcissist, you know, my, my self-confessed narcissist, <laughs> like an AA meeting, you and me, and uh, yeah. a narcissist meeting. Uh, yeah, exactly. but, but what about the people who worship these folks? There's, there's people out there, not maybe not Jim Jones, although I've interviewed some of his followers and they, they, some of them still like him. Yeah. Uh, but Charles Manson still has worshipers. Hitler certainly know, has worshipers. It's, and, it's crazy, but it is right. there. Yeah. But then what, what makes them – they're not narcissists, but why do they have that need – to follow and become a cult member? That's a great question, I'll, I, and I would love to engage that um, because it's kind of two quick answers to that. Yeah. You know, one, one is that that is definitely a different category of a cult follower or a tribal follower versus a leader. And taking away any kind of moral judgment, just looking – in general at leaders and followers the human race is full of that that dichotomy between those who just seem to have the traits that are we i mean we need leaders you know we can't have civilization without leaders so i'm not knocking that difference and we need quote followers we need people who are willing to get up and go to their job and and help the world by being there and doing i don't want to say doing what they're told but but I think you get my gist that we need people who uh, aren't wanting to be the boss but are wanting to be um, contributors uh, in whatever way, place they find themselves. Uh, so there's a there's an obvious difference in, in just the, the quality of what makes a leader. But then when it comes to cults, we have we have these extremes in both those categories. We have the the leaders who are over the top where they have to not just be the leader they have to be 
the dictator or the king or the 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 worshipful center in fact one of the one of those hallmarks of a cult is that they will always have one human being not not a god not jesus or someone but a human being at the center of their worship the center of their organization that can calls 90 percent of the shots and it's all very circular around that one dot in the center of the circle so that marks a cult and then the followers to get really to your question they uh have an a couple of things they have a, a greater need than average to feel belonging purpose and um, uh, being a member of a tribe, to put it in simple terms. Now, we all want to be in a tribe. I mean, I, I, I like being a football fan of a particular team, uh, uh, going to church. You want to feel like you can sign on to the belief system that you're mm-hmm. attending. Um, so that's normal. But when the tribalism becomes – here's the important uh, phrase. When it becomes framed as an us versus them – then we have a serious problem, and then, and then we have a cult, and cult followers buy to, for whatever reason, I don't want to call them gullible because many of them are just fine and wonderful people, but they, for something in their personality, they want, they long to buy into this is my tribe, and every other tribe must be wrong. Every other tribe mm-hmm. might even be evil, but I'm on the side of good. It's a good instinct. I want to be on the side of good, don't you, Ed? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but you, you see what I'm saying? It's it's a it's a personality type. I have to say that 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 jumps on the bandwagon, that signs on to the team bus a little too quickly. When I go to your Amazon page here and I look up the book, uh, Cults on Trial, A Cross-Examination of Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Donald Trump. Uh, by the way, yeah, great reviews, 4.8. There's only one four review. Every other review is five. Yay. Okay? Yeah, you can't beat that, okay? Especially yeah. on a topic like this, so controversial. You think? Right. I, I will get some attack. <laughs> Probably after this interview, I'll get some attack <laughs> reviews, but that's okay. Yeah, right. I, I got a, I got a big hate uh, listener. That was a hate listen. But, I heard you say that on your show a week or two ago yeah. about how much hate stuff you get. Like, what well, is that about? But that's another topic. That's another topic. Man. That's uh, no. Um, but you mentioned in here in the description, drawing upon court cases. What kind of court cases did you study to write this book? Ed, you're just doing wonderful questions here because <laughs> that is indeed – that, that – see, we focused on the subtitle at first because that's controversial. But the title is Cults on Trial, mm. and, and, and there's an important part of the book, beginning in the preface of the book, where um, I write that – when you take a cult leader who's a, normally accustomed to being, as I said, in charge, the dictator, the head of the cult, nobody questions him or her. When you take them and you place them into a courtroom, it's an artificial environment. It's a constructed environment where you have rules and you have an adversarial situation which is designed to elicit a greater truth. You've got the defense attorney and you've got the prosecution. They each have their stack of facts, hopefully, and those facts are tested by the way they're admitted into evidence. And then also um, there's the accountability of a little thing called perjury. Mm. So for some of these cult leaders, for the first time in their life, they have somebody saying to them, now, if you lie here, you can be arrested. You can be fined. You can even be put in jail just for telling a lie. And for people who use deception as one of their tools on my checklist of traits and tactics is using deception, spinning an alternate reality or a, or a narrative that's generally false. Uh, when you're accustomed to doing that and then suddenly uh, you're in a courtroom where they say, no, you can't do that or we're, we're going to call your hand on it. Uh, I say in the book, they become like a fish out of water, just mm. gasping for air. Uh, now, are we going to see that in these uh, Trump trials that are now go- going on? I think it will over time. It's going to take a while for that process. It doesn't happen in one day in court. It, it, it's an uh, sort of evolutionary process as, as, the, as time goes by. 
the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor, they eventually chip away at that alternate reality, and the jury begins to say, okay, I see this right here is bullshit, and, and this over here is not. So, yeah. 2327. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just had it to you, man. I'm a pastor. I don't normally use that. I, 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 consider that, that. I consider the bull word to be, it's become like a, a generic term for propaganda. Let's say that. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, I noticed here in your author, about the author, uh, it says that you're a pre sentence investigator for Alabama Circuit Court. So I'm sure you drew upon that experience, right? It's helped yeah. uh, add to my knowledge of the court process. Uh, most of the other stuff in my book, I've, I've studied cults all my life. I also, in the first chapter on the book, in the book, I talk about my own personal experience as a pastor counseling a couple that were uh, sort of refugees from a cult who had escaped a cult and needed help. And and that became formative. That was years ago, and that was, became formative in my thinking on this too. Uh, but study cults because they're interesting most of my life. But more recently, after I retired from from parish ministry, still needed a little a little help health insurance, so I, I have a, a, a day job, hmm. and my day job, I deal with the law and with uh, courts and with prosecutors and uh, that process. So, yes, that's been helpful for me to, to be refreshed on, on, on that side of things. So, yeah. And I bet you were a great pretrial investigator, too. I, I bet you had a lot of empathy for these people uh, and, and really took the job seriously because uh, I've seen so many errors well, I could say in those I reports, say, I could say a big yes to that, but that'll sound like a narcissist. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's my next question because now, now you, you mentioned you were in church leadership. You were a pastor. Uh, I was pastor of, of parish churches in Alabama and West Florida uh, in the United Methodist denomination, which I mentioned also in the book when I talk about Jim Jones. Mm. Um, as an aside, that's an interesting chapter in that. Jim Jones started out wanting to be what I was. He wanted to be a United Methodist denominational pastor, but the denomination, unlike just a church that started by one guy off on a street corner, um, has a series of uh, checks and measures and accountability measures that stopped Jones from becoming a Methodist pastor. So it's just kind of kind of fun to see the process worked, uh, the system worked in that case. Unfortunately, it wasn't a legal system. They couldn't arrest him for being crazy. They just identified him as crazy and said, no, you, you're really not the kind of guy we need leading a church. But back to your question, I had a successful ministry. I'm not a televan televangelist, so I don't have a private jet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but my question was, did you find yourself uh, uh, seduced? By, by the uh, because you know so many people in a church they adore their pastor they worship their pastor they, they he can do no wrong and the That's attention true. the constant That's attention did you find yourself seduced by that because I did uh, I my ego yeah I, yeah. yeah there's 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 two 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 sides of that coin yeah. uh, one side <laughs> is absolutely you get up every Sunday morning and you're the center of attention you know, pastor you're the center of attention and you get to speak uninterrupted for I tried to do a twenty minute sermon not drag it out. Uh, and then you go to the back door and you shake hands, and most of the people coming through are eager to shake your hand and say, Pastor, good to see you. Thank you for a wonderful sermon. You're wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, you know that can, be a, uh, that can make the ego get outsized. But the flip side of that coin is I like to say, like, okay, my last church when I retired, I had 500 members. Uh, so guess how many bosses I had? <laughs> Five hundred. <laughs> and and you would be surprised uh, what people will blame the pastor for. Um, they will blame you for the color of the paint in the fellowship hall, even though I had nothing to do with the choice of the color in the fellowship hall. <laughs> okay, so uh, so you do get enough uh, criticism and and uh, we'll say constructive criticism, but also sometimes just downright people just get downright downright mad at you, and, and uh, it, it does have a counterbalancing, humbling effect. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you this: I think probably my ego was was more. Uh, 
inflated by being a rock guitarist for a number of years mm. because there you don't really get a lot of critics. The, everybody's if they're assuming you're in a good band, which I was fortunate enough to be in a very good band, a couple of very good bands. So I wasn't even necessarily the, the greatest guitarist in the world, but good enough band where people say, man, y'all are awesome, y'all are awesome, and that's all you heard. So so yeah, there's a lot of places that a narcissist can 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 get. Mm. Um, fertilizer for their nar- narcissism and uh, maybe that's one reason why I retired I, I just needed to get back to kind of a normal life so I, I no longer play guitar on stage I no longer get up and, and do sermons uh, oh but here I am on the radio what are we going to do Ed <laughs> And, and as a rock star, people aren't complaining about the pew cushions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. People, that's like their biggest complaint. <laughs> yeah. The pew's not topic. It's your fault, Pastor, and you have to go, well, you know, these pews were installed literally 100 <laughs> years ago. I did not de- I did not design them. I did not put them in place. No. See, I wasn't kidding. He's got his answer already. <laughs> this is the number one church complaint. Dr. Lance Moore, the book is called Cults on Trial, a cross-examination of Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Trump. Uh, and you can find him at uh, uh, LanceMoreBooks.com. What kind of, as a society, what kind of guardrails can we put in place to uh, put some type of, uh, is to slow down the rise of these narcissist dictatorship cult leaders? Yeah, that's a challenge. Supreme Court ain't doing it. Yeah, that's a challenge in our in our day and age. Now, then once again, there's a couple of answers I could throw at you. Uh, you know, one is uh, looking at non-political cults. Uh, the easy answer, but hard to do, is is just better education. Uh, and I think the internet. Here's where I, I think the internet has actually helped with that. For instance, we take other cults I mentioned in the book, like Scientology, which. Sorry, Scientologists that are listening, but that's a belief system created out of whole cloth, out of thin air, by a science fiction writer who doesn't build on the Bible. He just builds on his idea that these extraterrestrials came and created Thetans and all this stuff. Um, so you can. So the point is, you can now, with just a few clicks of the mouse, type a few words. You can find volumes of absolute documentation showing the abuses of Scientology, the mistakes they've made, and and just the fallacy with the whole uh, you know, the whole uh, premise or philosophy um, using the internet. So so education. Uh, now the f- the other side of the equation where you have political demagogues, which function the same as cult leader in most cases, Hitler did. Um, <sighs> It's trickier there because the, a lot of times they have great power and control over the media. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Trump, well known for his entire political career, screaming about fake news. And now we have learned that actually he controlled a lot of the news. He controlled – he had a leash around the National Enquirer. It's just come out in court, Colts on trial, in court, uh, test – you know – Test sworn in testimony uh, by the owner of uh, National Enquirer, whose name I don't even want to say on the air. Uh, if you get my joke, sure. Uh, yeah, for the listeners, Ed had reminded me that FCC rules. You know, we're not supposed <laughs> to use certain words on the air. So, so anyway, that David P guy, uh, <laughs> he admitted that they fabricated stories, just made them up to boost the candidacy of Donald Trump. Then you've got before that, uh, you, uh, you've had Fox News in on on trial on the stand under sworn testimony where uh, both the owner and some of the top host commentators of Fox News also admitted under oath that they too lied and spun the news to uh, benefit Donald Trump. Now, in fairness, yes, absolutely, Democratic leaders have been known to control certain networks. Maybe control is too strong a word, but to strongly influence – I can think of one where uh, a CNN uh, commentator gave interview questions in advance to Hillary Clinton, uh, which is you know uh, uh, an unfair uh, slant on the news. So we, it is more difficult. I mean, I'm trying to answer your question in a roundabout way. And that is that I don't know the answers. It, I do think 
the, the trial process is one answer, a key answer. But as you just mentioned with Supreme Court kind of not looking too sharp the other day, we don't depend on any single judge or any single court. Uh, but if we keep uh, standing up for the principle of the rule of law, uh, I think that has a lot of value in, in stopping the excesses. Earlier, I was asking you some questions about uh, MK Ultra and stuff like that, right? And, and, and you, you mentioned uh, L. Ron Hubbard, who had a, a relationship with Alistair Crowley. Yes, you mentioned Crowley on the air the other day, so I thought about that. And and uh, Jack Parsons, interesting right. topic. Yeah, go ahead. Right, right, and and, and uh, both Crowley and uh, and Parsons and uh, right. uh, uh, Hubbard had intelligence backgrounds, um, and they had connections to the occult. And you look and you hit, uh, Charles Manson had a connection to the occult. Hitler had connections to the occult. Mm-hmm. Any of your studies uh, find a, a correlation between these narcissist dictatorships and the occult? Well, you actually brought up two things that each one of them could be a, a, a separate book, and yeah. that is the, the, the deep state intelligent connections. Uh, let me take that first just real quick because I would say – that it's usually not a case of this all-powerful deep state, Illuminati, or whatever word people want to use. Uh, like they didn't create, they didn't create Aleister Crowley. They didn't create even uh, Hubbard. But those personalities are always looking for an angle. They're oh, always yeah. looking for a power base. They're always looking for some way to get ahead. So if they have the opportunity to bump into uh, an intelligence agency that they can become a, uh, some some way associated with, uh, then uh, they might jump on that more than, say, you and I would because you and I would be going, well, I don't know that I want to promote my own career by selling out my country or whatever it might be. So uh, so there's, there's probably more of a coincidental thing going on with some of those such as like Jim Jones um, also is um, accused of having some kind of MK Ultra thing. The, the, the evidence on that stuff is pretty thin, and I think it's more on the side of coincidental than being some master plan that put these people in place. Uh, now, what was the other half of the equation I was talking about? I've lost my train of thought. Ed, help me out here. Well, one was their intel connections. The other one was their occult connections. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people believe that this QAnon thing was with, uh, that uh, Colonel Michael Aquino uh, and his uh, warfare, uh, mind war uh, Mm-hmm. Propaganda uh, material, because the same folks surrounding that are involved in, in QAnon. Uh, what, what do you make then? Well, I, let's say this first of all. As I say in the book, Coles on Trial, there is a difference, but a little overlap between the word occult and cult. They actually, um, I can say, real, I can sound real smart uh, in saying that I know Latin, because, but I'm not that smart about foreign languages. It was the only foreign language in college I was required to take one, and it was the only one that I found simple enough to, to deal with because I didn't have to learn how to speak it. It's a dead language. So so I learned some Latin, and the Latin derivatives or the, the roots for the word cult and the word occult are actually different. They're not, they're not the same thing. Um, so uh, a cult is more synonymous with the word sect, as in a religious sect that has a uh, that group of followers in a circle around uh, one particular leader. And the other thing that designates a sect or a cult is that they stand outside of society. They have their own little world um, versus occult, which means, as you know, a, a hidden. Uh, you know, if you have occult bleeding, it means you have blood in your intestines that you can't see, so it's hidden. So that's the word occult. So occult means hidden knowledge, or in some cases, you know, dark arts or, or black magic, which is in the shadows and stuff. So we had to distinguish those two words. Uh, I think that's helpful to remember. But then coincident or not coincidentally, then we do see the overlap where, again, Charles Manson dabbled in the occult. Uh, we mentioned L. Ron Hubbard. He got associated with uh, Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons, who was a Crowley disciple. And he was, he was genuinely into uh, black magic. Um, 
And then Jim Jones tinkered with a little bit. But most interestingly, I find, is Hitler. Uh, Hitler was absolutely all about uh, diving into uh, the occult worldview. And there's a whole chapter in my book on that. Oh, really? Yeah. The, in fact, the Hitler chapter focuses on two things. It focuses on the propaganda aspects and the mind manipulation and hypnotic effects that – Hitler seemed to have a skill for, and that's the connect, that's where it parallels Donald Trump. But I want to be fair to Trump. I have not seen Trump. I haven't seen any hard evidence that Trump is any kind of a cultist. I think he's just a <laughs> he's just a non-Christian. But I don't think I don't think he follows the devil or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Hitler Hitler was a uh, committed occultist, um, and I talk about the. Uh, the Thule is spelled T-H-U-L-E, the Thule or right. Thule Society that was a clear uh, cult uh, movement in Germany even be- even before even before Hitler was born, but he, he quickly found it and got into it. Am I making sense here? No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's easy to get sidetracked with this stuff because it goes every which direction. No, I, I would love to, to, to check out that chapter on, on Hitler and the occult because he actually – there was a certain kind of occultish flag that he had that each soldier, soldier had to physically touch that flag. You know, and, and they would line up and pass by the flag, and each one touched the flag in order to, to – just incredible uh, stuff when you look into that Hitler with the occult stuff. Absolutely. And, and it appears that Trump, although you're right, I, I, I know he's not uh, a Satanist or th- would have that kind of knowledge. You know, two Corinthians. The guy has no idea what he's talking <laughs> about. You, I laughed out loud. I saw that live, and I laughed out loud, and I said, no one else saw that. <laughs> You know, he's, he was at uh, Fowell University when he said that. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, I believe, and I, I think you can see it, but you can see it, hypnotic suggestion, man. To, yeah. Trump is very aware of that and the power of positive thinking. Norman well, Vincent to be Peel. honest, yeah. I got to interject there. Yeah. To be honest, it's it's on the record that, that Trump uh, read Hitler and oh, yeah. and emulated some of his ta- uh, traits and tactics purposefully. Uh, and it's been successful for him. The way you speak to people, the the way you engage people with trigger words and words that speak to their kind of deep tribalism. And that's what you know Hitler did with the, the whole Aryan thing. Uh, you talk about the symbols. The swastika is a actually a Hindu uh, Indian uh, uh, symbol that he adapted. But he also had the, the I think the one you referred to is the SS, which is actually a pair of lightning bolts. That's a very occult symbol. Um, and he he had his his higher elite officers uh, had to go to these rituals where they were kind of like being knights of the round table, except uh, nefarious knights. No, so then your background is Methodist, right? Correct. Right. So so then uh, uh, your belief in the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit, uh, sure. healing, uh, uh, tongues, uh, prophecy. Uh, as Methodists, we we don't emphasize yeah. that as much as say the Pentecostalists do, but uh, I don't scoff at people's uh, religious ex- religious expressions. Um, we Methodism is a little more leaning toward the r- sort of rational academic side of things right. for 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 good or for bad, depending on your view. But but uh, but uh, I, I totally want to encourage people to to embrace spirituality in the way that that is meaningful meaningful for them as long as it's not harming anybody so anyway. yeah i couldn't agree more just that that the uh, fellowship you know of, of being in that body of christ every weekend yeah uh, yeah you, you can't you, you can't oh, be, <laughs> oh, well, let me let me interject yeah. this then yeah. because you made me think of it i also have a chapter in the same book Colts on trial about is christianity a cult hmm. Because it does mark Christian churches and Christian movements do check off some of those same uh, checklist hallmarks of a cult. Uh, but then I spell out where the differences are. But, uh, I mean, Jesus started out with <laughs> what was functionally a cult. Twelve disciples all circled around him as the one authoritative leader. Uh, and so, so yes, I have I have to be honest with dealing with that. And I, and I do so in the book in a way I, I hope is helpful so that people can see I'm not just dismissing the good instinct to be want to belong into a community. 
philosophy, to have beliefs, to even have a kind of tribe you root for. There's nothing wrong with that until it goes beyond the pale. So, so true, because isolation uh, c- can even be worse. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. And you become more isolated. And they, they talk about it with this new social media obsession and addictions. Um, the more isolated you are, the more likely you are to uh, become uh, involved in conspiracies and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, racism you know and a, a bigotry and you know this these kind of uh, negative um, traits one of the when i look at you on amazon once again it says uh, part of the book is exposing the methods of manipulation found in cults yes so one of the, the to me the heart of this book that i think would be useful to people regardless of where they fall on the spectrum of politics or religion um is uh, it's actually on my copy. It's on page thirty-two. The cult culture template of traits. That's a long phrase, but you know, cults have a certain culture, a certain way of of being. Their their methods and means, and uh, there are eight significant categories that I talk about, uh, beginning on page thirty-two. If anybody got to, wants to get the book, where I spell out. I, I think it's very helpful, even though some of them are obvious. It's when you see them all written down together that it paints a picture of, okay, I see what's going on there. Mm. Um, well, just to take one of them real quickly. I don't know how much time we got left. we got about, about 10 minutes. Uh, we have plenty of time. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, like number three on the list is uh, cults and their leaders use resonant emotion and compelling narrative. Cult leaders connect with followers Via emotion first, not reason, using a passionate narrative to trump data. And I'm using the little letter trump there. <laughs> that that narrative is more important to them than facts. They spin a mythology or a, a, a version of reality that can be very emotionally attractive. And I talk about resonant emotion. That um, Well, I have a fun thing in the book um, that if you – if you are familiar with acoustics, going back to my guitar background, if you take an acoustic guitar and set it next to a piano, hmm. and, and they're tuned together, you know, the, with the, we're both at A440, and you strike the A key on the piano, the A string on the guitar will ring with it without touching the guitar. Whoa! And, that, and that's called resonance. It's a f- principle of physics and acoustics and that so that resonance is pretty cool it's pretty cool that it that happens um it's like the piano's reaching out and strumming the guitar it's very very soft but it but it's for for real so i take that and say this can happen with people a leader who has a a kind of natural gift for uh look let's say looking at ed and it's going I've I've gotten to know Ed here a little bit, and I know what really rings with him, what really is meaningful to him, and that's the string I'm going to pluck. And once I act like I care about that same string, um, and you mentioned racism, that can be an example. If I see, well, I shouldn't have used you, Ed. <laughs> but okay. Let's say John, John Doe. If I see, man, he is really passionate about uh, hating ethnic minorities. So I'm going to throw a little a little buzzword out here that rings his string. That he'll think that I am total uh, agreement. Uh, I am. Empathetic, sympathetic, and resonantly emotional with him. That's very powerful to people. Uh, it, it strikes at a person's core longings. Right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the narrative is to go beyond, uh, say, a single thing. To have a narrative that's compelling, that's as old as uh, cavemen sitting around a fire – and the eldest cave man tells a story about the time that they had a great forest fire and they had to flee as a tribe and how they survived and how they overcame that. And that cements everybody to the tribe because it's, it's just a – it's a great story. I mean this is like any great movie or TV show. If it has a, that, that – the elements of, of uh, uh, you know, of plot and um, – uh, a challenge has to be overcome, and then a resolution, you know, conflict and resolution. Uh, the, the elements of story are rooted in who we are as humans. We all love to hear a story. So some of these leaders, uh, Manson comes to mind. He can't. He has us uh, in another chapter. I talk about. He spun this ridiculous story about uh, the coming collapse of civilization and how they were going to save the world when they were only, you know, at 
tops, maybe 40 people in his cult uh, at the max. Uh, but they were going to save the world because he has this narrative that's compelling and he was a good storyteller and it just it hooks people. Mm. And you can then connect in QAnon, which I have a chapter on. Oh, really? QAnon has a story that there's all these uh, baby eating Satanists who are out to get you and they're out to, and we've got to stop them. And, um, you know, that's pretty compelling. I, I'd like to stop any baby eating Satanists uh, that I see. <laughs> so uh, it sounds absurd, but that's, that's an example of what goes on. It, it grabs people. And just imagine, too, like Manson's followers, they had never read the book of Revelation. So whatever he tells them, you know, they're, they're, oh, oh, really? That's what it says? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they believe whatever he says. Yeah, they were young. You got a point there, too. They were yeah. young. In his case, they were mostly young people, and uh, they're more impressionable, and uh, cult followers often are very impressionable. So you said you had eight, and what, the first one was emotion. Oh, oh, well, I'll just hit these real quick if you yeah. got a minute. The first one is obvious. That, that was not the, fir the first one. That was just one that gotcha. I think is kind of fresh that people don't think about a lot. The first one is obvious. Uh, personality worship of a charismatic narcissist. Cults are centered around that leader, and we talked about that. Um, second is psycho psychopathy or psychopathy. Uh, frankly, many cult leaders are criminal psychopaths, and mm. that gives them a power. Because, you know, you and I have a limit to our power because we're not going to do something that's going to hurt somebody. But a psychopath doesn't give a hoot. They will hurt anybody if it pr furthers their goals. And so that gives them a power and it gives them within an organization um, uh, an ability to not play fair <laughs> and, and that increases the power. So number, number three is resonant emotion and compelling narrative that kind of go hand in hand. Number four is manipulation and mind control within an authoritarian structure, uh, that's where the cult leaders are masters at manipulation, and they will use uh, a variety of tricks and leverage uh, to be king, basically, within the cult. Number five, uh, messianic cult leaders, and they don't all, every cult leader doesn't check off every one of these boxes, okay, just most of the boxes. Some, as we mentioned, set themselves up as the savior. We've got this enemy out here, this us and them, which is actually number six, tribalism, the us and them worldview. But number four is that I'm going to be, I'm sorry, number five is I'm going to be the, the Messiah who can save us from those enemies out there. Uh, and often that's tied in with a religious thing that I'm I'm anointed by God, I've got supernatural power, or I'm called as the prophet or the chosen one to save us. Uh, it's striking that uh, some televangelists were calling Trump the chosen one and the anointed one, which is another day's topic. Um, to finish up here, uh, number six is tribalism, that, that worldview of it's us versus them that glues the group together. And number seven is um, one of – this is more in the motive behind a cult leader is self-enrichment. Hmm. In cults, the cult leader owns or at least controls everything, and their dictatorial power usually leads to their own enrichment. And uh, with, those, with that couple that came into my office for counseling uh, that had escaped a cult – uh, so one of the f things I was able to do for them was uh, help them uh, reclaim the value of the Range Rover uh, $100,000 uh, automobile that they had bought for the cult leader because uh, <laughs> he wanted to drive a fancy car, uh, but they paid for it, and so the, uh, they were able to get that back in court. And then, uh, Well, I actually I didn't help them with court. I helped them sell the vehicle in the end uh, so they could live. Uh, anyway, I digress. You know, on the other side of that, I just recently interviewed uh, Doug Papa, who was a, a cop. And uh, when he lost his job, he was recruited by the Cult Awareness Network uh, by a bunch of on-duty cops uh, and <laughs> FBI agents. Well, not, well, not FBI, but on-duty cops who were running around kidnapping people to deprogram them. And even they became corrupt and started kidnapping people that were lesbian to, to reprogram them <laughs> from their lesbianism. Okay? So, yeah, even... I don't know. In my chapter on solutions to yeah. – 
cult thing. Uh, I certainly don't recommend that because, <laughs> that's, because that's it. That's that's like that's no worse than the cult leaders because you're taking right. people against their will. Uh, there has to be a better way, and I think there is. Uh, but uh, being positive, reaching out with love and an alternative community of care and love, uh, that's much more effective than if you deprogram somebody. Uh, then eventually they're going to get around to realizing, oh, they made a the, they manipulated me just as much as the cult leader did. Oh, absolutely. I was saying that the programs were just as abusive as the cult leaders. We only got a couple of minutes left. Okay. Now, we're in scary times. These are terrifying times. Now, what is the solution? We elect Biden instead of cult and, uh, instead of Trump, and, and all this is going to go away? This, yeah. this insanity is not going to go away, man. What do we do, uh, Dr. Perfect. Lance Moore? Oh, man. <laughs> it's, you your, want, it's in your hands. You want me to solve the big problem. <laughs> uh, the, the big problem is our political system is, is yeah. pretty well uh, – well, on one hand, I embrace our political system as far as uh, democracy and the Constitution, which the Constitution and the Founding Fathers had a great idea. But we've become this two-party system where neither party has any has any real allegiance to the working person. Uh, their allegiance is to corporations. You know this. And so I'm not like uh, Mr. Gung-Ho Biden. I, we're given a pretty binary choice this particular election, and I think you got to choose the lesser of the evils. Um, uh, and 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 I don't think that Mr. Biden will destroy our democracy. Okay, but yeah, we got a much bigger problem, and that goes to my book, Class Crucifixion, where people who are greedy, it's like excessively greedy, the 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 uber capitalist, and who have uh, no moral uh, whims or whatever, no no moral values. Um, uh, right now, we're at their mercy. And they've got money which controls the politics and they control our lives. And my only answer, Ed, is to do what we're doing, which is write books and use podcasts and radio and internet and TV, any access that we can find to get an alternative view out uh, rather than what is fed to us by the corporate behemoths that uh, – that seem to own the – own the well, they own the airwaves to a large yeah. degree. The internet's changing that though. Well, we'll keep shoveling into the ocean. <laughs> okay, so we've been talking to Dr. Lance Moore, LanceMoreBooks.com. The book we've been talking about is Cults on Trial, a cross-examination of Jim Jones, Charles Manson, Hitler, and Donald Trump, but many, many, many books here. If you go to uh, LanceMoreBooks.com, A God Beyond Belief, Class Crucifixion, Killing JFK's 50 Years of Lies. i got to tell you, Dr. Lance Moore um, – you know, I, I'm I'm struggling with with doing this job. You know, yeah. years. Uh, it's an uphill battle. You know, I get but, it. and, and uh, you know, to, to have this, an afternoon to talk to someone as brilliant as you and as likable as you, you you've talked me off the ledge one more day. Oh, good, <laughs> okay. good. I hope okay. I've done something today. Oh, well, I totally encourage. And this is going to sound sycophantic or whatever, but let yeah. it be. Uh, I totally encourage you. I just said yeah. this is exactly the, one of the solutions we have to our <laughs> problem is to get people like you out there uh, fighting a good fight, even though it can be frustrating. Thank you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Call me tomorrow around this time, okay? <laughs> Cheer <laughs> you up again. Let, Dr. Lance Moore, one more time. LanceMoorBooks.com. You hear the guy. He's a great storyteller. Uh, you can imagine what the books are like. The Cults on Trial has 4.8 reviews. Whoever this four guy was, I can I, I would imagine what his complaint was <laughs> to give you a four-star review. <laughs> oh, the, yeah, but, I don't think too many books are perfect. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Lance included. Moore. Hey, I hope we'll come back. Maybe we'll talk about God Beyond belief next time a little more uh whatever yeah, uh, less enjoy. less emotional topic as far as the the politics yeah whatever i, I wouldn't definitely enjoy it thank you so much thank you good night